Yep. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, Here I am. Professor, thank you so much for joining us today. I am going to be uploading this onto YouTube for the right. Radio TV Film 100 Intro to Electronic Media class at San Diego City College. And uh, this is a great class because we get to kind of dabble into different areas. And um, you are a distinguished professor emeritus from San Diego State University, over 30 yeah. years of teaching, but you also have a prior history of work. Yes, history. I do. So tell us a little bit about that. Just, you know, keep it short, but tell us in an oral. Right. Oral well, I joined, I joined the FCC, oh, years ago as an attorney advisor to the general counsel and then became the legal advisor to the chairman, um, a fellow named Dean Birch. And I worked for him for about two or three years, maybe three years before I got tapped to go to the White House and be the number two in charge of telecom policy for the president. Not too many, that's not too many that people about three that. that's, a, that's a big title to wear. Um, and I'm sure that your students, all those years you taught at San Diego State were so lucky and fortunate to have you bring that experience into the classroom because it doesn't happen too often when you get that. Uh, I, I, would, I would say they were, um, the muse. Oh, excuse me. Oh my, what are you? It's, you <laughs> that's, oh, that's the part I'm of a cat person too. <laughs> I'm a cat person. I love my cats. I know students, you're going to get a kick out of that one. That just, <laughs> just happens, you know, it just happens. So um, let's start talking about um, the job that you did with the FCC. Like, why, why was the FCC so important in the 70s? Why was well, it important? Uh, as, as you as you well know, um, the regulation really is about the broadcast media, which is radio and television, and then because they granted a monopoly to AT and T in order to get service out as quickly as possible, they regulated telephony as as well. Um, the new media, with some minor exception for cable, is not regulated by the FCC at all. In fact, one of the things that I hope we get into a little bit is there were all kinds of regulations in 1970 because it was deemed that all broadcasters, broadcasters operated in the public interest. That is to say, they serve the people. That no longer is the case. Mm -hmm. And why do you say that? What do you mean they no longer serve the people? Well, uh, initially, anybody who got a broadcast license had to prove they were legally qualified, that is, they were a U.S. citizen. Uh, they had the technical wherewithal to launch a signal, and they were financially qualified, as to say, they could go out, make program or buy programming. Uh, they filled the channel up. Uh, and every year they would go out and ascertain the needs of the community they serve. Slowly but surely, all that was eroded. Uh, broadcasters no longer have to ascertain the needs and there's very little regulation of what they broadcast. Uh, for example, in the early days, um, broadcasters had to really not only serve the people, they couldn't put on programming that was too one-sided. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't put on programming um, that uh, was biased in any way. They had a complaints and compliance bureau, so anybody could file a complaint. All of those regulations, including something called cross ownership, or multiple ownership, how many stations one uh, broadcaster could own, got eliminated. Mm -hmm. the, the fairness doctrine was eliminated. The regulation of content was totally demolished uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, it was said that any broadcaster could say whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Wow. Well, um, that brings me to some other questions that I know I have, and then the students also sent some questions in, so I'm going to ask you. 
about them. Um, when you talk about fines, they just had an assignment where they had to literally look up some of the files. They chose a station and they went digging in the files, which are all public files. A lot of them um, just yeah. like when I was their age, didn't, you know, younger, didn't realize that you could do that. Yeah. And I don't think oh, yeah. the public even knows they're there and they certainly don't look, but you can see that some of them have been fined for certain things, smaller infractions these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enormous. There was a lot of closed captioning. There was some, um, you know, some other complaints. How strict are those fines and who's policing? Sadly, <laughs> one used to survey the files and they would what's called file on top of a broadcaster because it was felt that if the broadcaster wasn't serving their community, they could lose their license. Um, that no longer exists. So I don't know if anybody's lost a license in years, probably 30 years. It used to be that if you were an advocacy group, advocacy group, as there was uh, a parental group, um, an abortion group, uh, a no smoking group, that you could scour the records, look at the programming and file a complaint, which usually resulted in a fine, if not the loss of a license. That was eradicated as well. It's very rare that the commission will revoke a license. I, I mean, I don't think any license has been revoked. It's also very rare to file a complaint that says this broadcast station is only pro-abortion. Mm. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it used to be that you there was a bureau, the same bureau, that measured how much you broadcast for and against. And you had to show both sides of a controversial issue. Uh, that too is eliminated. Well, I, I think, I mean, if you look at a couple of, you know, One America News or you look at Fox or, you know, in some cases people would say MSNBC. Yeah. You could see where that certainly is not the case anymore. <laughs> uh, sadly, no. Now, part of the reason they say, uh, apart from the First Amendment, is that there's so many other outlets um, competing with broadcasting that don't fall under any regulation at all. And so therefore to level the playing field, a lot of regulations were eliminated. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the students pointed out to me, or several of them actually had, uh, as they were digging and looking into these files, uh, realized they chose stations that had um, their transmission towers in Mexico. So, if a station has their transmitter in Mexico, are all bets off? They don't have to file the same type of paperwork? Or No, uh, that is one of the few instances, instances where the commission will get more involved because they didn't, nor do they have the power to issue licenses for other countries. Mm -hmm. And so this is a violation a technical violation, a violation of the technical rules that require them to broadcast from within the U.S. So they could be subject to further investigation, a fine or a revocation. Yes, that is. Well, let, let me list the, since we're on this one, if you are financially corrupt, you get put in jail or you're bankrupt, you can lose your license. The technical one we just discussed, uh, you can lose your license. Um, they say, they say failure to failure to serve the public, but it's never been tested. That's a tough one. That's a gray area. Yeah, because you know, you 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 submit a a survey and say, you know what, this is a very pro-abortion audience. Uh, we've done a survey and 60% of our audience believes that. So what Fox has done is find out what some people across the country were thinking and then gave them what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the election was so skewed uh, 
in 2016, nobody wants to touch that one. Nobody wants to touch it one because it gets the commission in deep mm -hmm. into the, the, the political process and they are regulated in turn. The FCC is regulated by the Congress. So you can imagine how political the Congress is that is affecting to the extent to which the commission will act. And um, one of the students wanted to know, why is the U.S. so restricted compared to Europe and other countries when it comes to language and nudity and things like that? Why is the U.S.? Yeah, I don't know that we are. Um, I don't know that we are. Um, it used to be, for example, that if you broadcast candy, you know, one of your advertisers, you had to show a toothbrush <laughs> because uh you shouldn't have candy without knowing that it could rot your teeth but so uh and in france it used to be that you could only advertise at certain times a day so there were a lot of str more stringent regulations um on europe stations than there were on the u.s okay that's a um a question from a student and then another one did you disagree with any regulations placed during your time at the FCC in the 70s? Which ones uh, did you totally disagree with? And what did you totally agree with? Well, I totally disagreed with the elimination of something called the Fairness Doctrine, which is, says if a broadcaster covers one side of an issue, it owes an obligation to its audience to show the other side as well. Um, the broadcasters complained that this was not only an abridgment of freedom of speech, uh, it made the station less controversial because a lot of stations say, would say, well, this is a controversial issue. I'm not going to cover it at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't uh, want any scrutiny from the commission for being unfair on one issue or another. So they argued successfully that for both of those reasons, First Amendment and um, the unwillingness to get involved, that it ought to be eliminated. And so the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated, at least while I was there. Now, what did I agree with? I really agreed with the Complaints and Compliance um, Bureau. Was there which, a team? Was there a whole team that? There was a whole team that would measure uh, program content that was pro or con. They would look closely at obscenity, uh, pornography. Uh, these were all very much scrutinized. Um, the argument again was, "Oh, we aren't going to take any risk. I'm a broadcaster. I won't take any risk because I don't want to get scrutinized by." A handful of government officials. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And recently, um, you wrote a commentary and op-ed for the Union Tribune on Facebook and social media. Yeah. Um, how how in the world um, can any of that be regulated? I mean, it doesn't see. It seems like the FCC has lost a lot of power over the years. Well, we so have something they, today. How could they algorithms? Right. And the algorithm allows you to mechanically determine whether something is hate speech or it falls into something that's totally untrue or falls into a category of disinformation or falls in the category of obscenity. Now, I think the, the cable company, the social media companies can ferret out all of those things which we find unacceptable. One of the problems and one of the, the points that I made very strongly in the editorial that I wrote for your paper was that right now, nobody can sue the social media. They're exempt from all lawsuits. And the, the Congress 25 years ago was worried that maybe social media, Facebook or whatever, the internet would be overly scrutinized and it wouldn't, wouldn't develop as it should be. So they, they 
put in this prohibition against any kind of regulation. And my point, the argument that I made is that, hey, today, more than 50% rely on social media for news. And as a consequence, they're exposed to hate speech. They're exposed to disinformation. They're exposed to anything that anybody wants to post. That's wrong. That's wrong. It's so big now. It's global and it penetrates every person on the planet. And they've simply got to step in and eliminate that section uh, which regulates them and also begin pushing them for self-regulation, which they can do because of algorithms. And if you've noticed, uh, for some strange reason, uh, Facebook, among others, are posting ads and uh, your paper, others, saying we should be regulated. Now, you might say, well, why are they asking for regulation? They want to be part of the solution. They know it's coming. Eventually, it's coming. Yeah. Now, if there were regulation, though, you know, again, with the FCC having shrunk and not gotten bigger, oh, yeah. should that be the responsibility of the FCC to oversee these social media companies? Or do you think that's an entirely different new wing of the government? That Not completely. I think the Congress has to bite the bullet and say, these things are not allowed. Mm -hmm. In other words, set some overall generic standards for proper behavior and then allow which they don't now, allow people to complain, allow people to file suits, give more power into the hands of the public, which, which are, as it is now, their hands are tied. And what do you think the future of the FCC is? Well, I don't think we'll ever eliminate it. Um, in fact, kind of a joke, once you create something, it's never eliminated. And then government gets bigger and bigger. But there is clearly a role for some governmental guidance over all media, not just broadcasters or not just social media, but who knows what will come um, in the way of new inventions to use the internet, uh, however it's defined. So I think there needs to be someone outside of Congress, outside of the executive, outside of the courts, like a regulatory agency mm -hmm. that becomes expertise in a certain media. Uh, we have a, um, an FAA, which regulates airlines. We have uh, uh, something that regulates um, the environment, the Environmental Protection Agency. And these are you know, appointed, the, the heads are appointed by the president, they're regulated, their budget certainly by the Congress, and if someone objects, they can go to the courts. So you still have the three branches of government, but when you get into something very technical like broadcasting, social media, uh, we need certain expertise in government to set standards. So that's it. Right. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, times are certainly changing people the way they're gathering their news. They're not sitting down in front of the five o'clock news anymore. No. Um, so the, everything's and they're not reading newspapers. I know. As much that's, as they used to. that's a conversation the for news today, but there, there's yeah. changes. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're checking links, you're checking two or three sources, you're making sure something is verifiable, right? which is very hard. It's very hard to do that now compared to the way it used yeah. to be. So, yeah. well, Professor Emeritus, John Eager, thank you so much. Oh, for Laura, so today. good to see you. you. look great, by the way. Oh, thank you. You're so Yeah, I, I, you're, not, you're obviously enjoying your... <laughs> no, oh. it's been rough. This, uh, this whole pandemic has been rough. Let me stop this yeah. recording for the students right here. Thank you again.